Upon that, that we are even fortunate and blessed that we are in the Ummah of Muhammad Since Prophet Adam, people who followed Prophet Adam, even they were Muslims. People who followed Prophet Nuh, even they were Muslims. People who followed Prophet Ibrahim, even they were Muslims. Every Prophet's nation were Muslims. This is not true that many people, even the Muslims, they think that Prophet Muhammad is the founder of Islam. This is not true. Because if this is true, then this means that every Prophet who came to this earth, they taught different religion. Is this the case? <coughs> does, that, does this mean that Allah sent so many different religions? No, Allah only sent one religion. Prophet Adam taught the same message that there is no God but Allah and I am his Prophet. <coughs> Prophet Nuh, same message. Prophet Ibrahim, same message. So this statement that Prophet Muhammad is the founder of Islam is not true. In fact, he is the completer of Islam. You should know this. Prophet Adam started Islam. He is the founder of Islam. Allah sent him as the first messenger. And the last messenger was Muhammad Sallallahu so every Prophet told the same religion which is called submission to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another word, it is called Islam. If we have a problem with Islam, don't call Islam. Call submission. We don't mind. Submission means, or Muslim, or Islam means somebody who gives up his desires, you give up your choices, and you live your life according to the choice of Allah Almighty. This is Islam. What's wrong with that? So every Prophet taught the same religion, but we, Alhamdulillah, we should, no matter how much we thank Allah for this favor that Allah blessed us, that we are the followers of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because no Prophet is allowed to enter Jannah until Prophet Muhammad enters it. He is the last to come, but first in Jannah. He is the last of the Prophet, but first in Jannah. And we as the Ummah, as the nation of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the last nation but first in Jannat. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said very clearly, he said, no Prophet will enter into paradise until I enter. And no Ummah, no nation can enter until my nation enters. So isn't that a great favor of Allah? Indeed it is. So many favors of Allah, but this favor of Islam is very great. What is Islam? Islam is the complete way of life. One of the last verses of the Quran is Al Yawma Akmaltu Lakum Deenakum, Watmamtu Alaikum Ni'amati, Waraditu Lakum al Islam Adina. This verse, this ayah was revealed to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu around eighty days before he passed away, before his departure, <coughs> in which Allah has said, Today I have completed your religion for you. 
اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم Your deen, your way of life is completed today Nothing can be added and nothing can be taken out This is the reason why when a person does something new in Islam which is called bid'ah is not allowed in Islam We were told to pray two rakat in salah but somebody says you know what I am very fresh start of the day I need to pray five rakat I need to pray ten rakat of farz I want to get more reward, I want to be more close to Allah. Is he allowed to do so? Why? Because Islam says only to pray to. You can't add anything, you can't delete anything, because Islam is complete. This is the reason why Islam is very against bid'at, innovation in Islam. Many people, they started new new things in Islam, which is completely rejected in Islam. In fact, Imam Malik rahimullah said, anybody who introduces new thing in Islam, na'udhu billah, may Allah protect us, he is trying to say that Prophet Muhammad <laughs> did not do his good job. So I am here to do something new in Islam which he could not do, na'udhu billah. So Islam is complete. And then he said, وَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي By completing your Islam, I am completing my favor upon you. Meaning Allah is himself calling Islam a favor, a na'mat, a bounty. And then he said, وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينَ And I am very pleased, I am very happy that Islam is your religion. إِنَّ الدِّينَ عِنَّ اللَّهِ Islam, the religion accepted by Allah is only submission to Allah which is Islam. And then Allah has said, وَمَنْ يَبْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا Anybody who chooses any other way of life, as his lifestyle, فَلَنْ يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ Allah will not accept it from him and وَهُوَ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ and he will be from the losers. Because Allah only sent one way of life. Allah did not send so many ways of life to confuse people. Allah only sent one way of life taught by every single prophet of Islam. So this Islam is a great favor, my brothers. Don't underestimate this favor. Do not underestimate, do not think that society will not be happy with you if you show your Islam to people. Many people, alhamdulillah, two years ago we were invited in America for Taraweeh Salah, then from there I went to Canada to meet my cousins and me and my cousins went to buy one, one car from this garage and the brother on the phone who was dealing, he sounded like Asian. Our Muslim. But he said, I am George. I said, okay, but I never knew who this brother is until we went actually to see him. When we went there to do the final <coughs> dealing, we done that dealing with him. Then at the end I asked him, brother, do you look like Asian? Are you, which country are you from? He said, I am from Afghanistan. I said, okay, mashallah, but are you Muslim, non-Muslim, what are you? I said, I'm Muslim. I said, but you said your name is George. What is, what, what's the story behind? He said, brother, I'm sorry, but my real name is Abdul Jabbar, but I want to work here, so to get a job here, I'll change my name to George. So why do people feel that, you know, we, we are threatened, we are, you know, under pressure, <coughs> that if we call ourselves Muslims, and if we look like Muslims, what's wrong with it? Be proud. <coughs> Don't be a victim. <coughs> Don't take the pressure. Islam is there. Hazrat Umar bin Khattab, do you know his history? That before Islam, he was the enemy of Islam. <coughs> but when Allah, when Allah guided him, he became the friend of Islam that nobody could face him. And he used to say that I was shepherd. Before Islam, I used to graze animals. <coughs> but after Islam, Allah elevated my status so much that I am re I'm the leader of the Muslims to half of the world. And then he used to say, Allah blessed us, Azzan Allah bil Islam, Allah blessed us with Islam, and anybody who wants to get respect in any other way of life, Allah will disgrace him. This is the reality. So this Islam teaches us complete way of life. From the top listed things to the bottom listed. Anything you, you mention, Islam is there to guide. So much so, one of the teaching of Islam is istinja which I want to speak about today, which many people don't have the knowledge of. Istinja means when you go to relieve yourself in the toilet, when you go for natural call, after that, the cleaning, cleaning your private parts, cleaning yourself is called istinja. 
Islam is there to guard even for that. Even though that Sahaba, when Prophet of Allah came to Medina, Makkah, he started teaching the Sahaba, his students, that when you clean yourself, clean it like this. And they started practicing upon it. And when the mushrikeen, the disbelievers, when the Yahud, they seen the Muslims taking so much, you know, care in the toilet or when they go for natural cold, they used to laugh with them. Look at these people. They even, you know, be careful in the toilet. Then they did not feel threatened. Hazrat Salman Farsi, he said, yes, I'm proud. He said, I'm proud, yes, the hadith is in Muslim. He said that, قَالَ بَعْضُ الْمُشْرِكِينَ وَهُوَ يَسْتَهْزِي That some mushrikeen, you know, they had an objection. They raised an objection, they started laughing and taking the mick out of the Muslims, saying that, look at these people. إِنِّي لَا أَرَى صَاحِبَكُمْ يُعَلِّمَكُمْ حَتَّى الْخَرَاءَ I see your Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam teaching you everything, even the toilet. How to use the toilet? He said, yes, naam. I am proud of it, that our Islam teaches us even how to go to the toilet. Nothing to be ashamed of. He was very proud. And then he explained. He said, what does he teach us? He said, Amarna. Our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us, Allah nastaqbil al-qibla, that when we go for natural cold, when we sit in the toilet, we should try and we should not face our we should not face the Qibla, or we should not put our face towards the Qibla as well. Meaning, when we relieve ourselves, our back and our front should not be facing the Qibla. This way is the Qibla we pray, so our toilet should not be like this, that our back or our front is facing the Qibla. It should be like this, that our sides are facing the Qibla, not our front or back. <coughs> this is the first teaching he taught us, because Qibla is our, our Sha'ir, element of Islam. Number two, he said, Wala nastanji bi imanina. He said, What's wrong with it? Our Prophet taught us that we should not clean our private part with our right hand. <coughs> Islam teaches us that we should not use our right hand in the toilet. Use your left hand. This is the second teaching. And then he said, Wala naktafiya biduni ahjarin. In those days, people used to use mud stones. As you, maybe you are aware of it, they used to use mud stones because of there was no water, no, not easily available water, so they used to use mud stones to dry themselves, to clean themselves. Nowadays we have tissues, which is the alternative. And then he said, It should not be bones, it should not be charcoal or anything like that, it should be pure mud stones. We should use that and use three of them to clean it more properly. He said, this is our teaching, this is our Prophet ﷺ taught us. He was proud of it. So this, regarding Astenja, four things we should keep in mind. Briefly, there's no time, but many youngsters, very unfortunately, when we hear, when we see them, we tell them to pray Salah, they say, brother, I'm sorry, my, my clothes are not back, my clothes are unclean. What does that mean? It means simply that when, when they went to the toilet, maybe they stood and they urinated and the drops of urine touched their clothes. And now they're saying, I can't pray Salah because I'm not clean. You must have heard people saying this. I heard here in our masjid. But Islam is against this. Prophet of Allah is against this. So four things we should keep in mind regarding astinja, regarding when we go to relieve ourselves. Number one <coughs> is to read the dua. Islam is there to teach us to read the dua, ask Allah for protection on different occasions. On this occasion of using the toilet, we are taught to read one dua. Hazrat Aisha, she says, sorry, Anas Radhiallahu he says, Kana Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam When Prophet of Allah used to enter the Baytul Khala. Baytul Khala, Bayt means house, Khala means place of loneliness. So bait, the toilet in Arabic is known as Baytul Khala, the place of loneliness where nobody lives, where nobody stays. So you just go there for time, just you know, to relieve yourself and come out. So he said that when he used to enter, before entering the toilet, obviously you should not read this dua inside the toilet, but before entering the toilet, with the left foot, he used to read, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al khubuti wal khaba'if, that oh Allah protect me. because. The place where we relieve ourselves, you, we will not find angels there. You will only find shayateen and the jinns and the devils. So you ask Allah for protection against their mischief. 
So you by saying Allahumma O Allah, inni a'udhu bika. I ask for your protection, for your refuge against the male devil and the female devil. The shayateen. This dua is the sunnah. We should all know it. Our children should know it. Our youngsters should know it. Before entering the toilet, we should read this dua. And after relieving ourselves, we should leave with right foot. We should enter with left foot and we should leave with right foot and read two narrations mentioned. One narration by Azat Aisha, she says that قالت, This riwayah comes in Tirmidhi ibn Majah and in Darimi. That she says that when Prophet of Allah used to leave the lavatory in the toilet, he used to say غفرانك. Only one word, which means, Oh Allah, please forgive me. غفرانك. This riwayah only mentions one. One word which means غفرانك. But you must have heard another long dua with it, which is Alhamdulillah الذي يذهب عني الأذى وعافاني which is a different narration mentioned by Hazrat Anas who says that when Prophet of Allah used to leave the lavatory he used to say Alhamdulillah الذي يذهب عني الأذى وعافاني that Oh Allah, praise be to you just imagine for a while I know a person when I was studying in my madrasa in Kidmanista near Birmingham there was one student a young boy maybe now he's 25 years old but he was disabled. His disability was that he could not relieve himself naturally. If you understand what, what, what I'm trying to say. He could not go to the toilet in a normal way which we all go. What used to happen that doctors twice or three times a week used to operate him and from his arm or from his body part they used to take his all his you know, filth out. But he could not relieve himself generally and normally in the way we, we do. So imagine this favor of Allah. The food we eat, the water we eat, this must go out as well. Otherwise, what's going to happen to our body? So this dua teaches us that we should also praise Allah, thank Allah, that Alhamdulillah, oh Allah, thank you so much. Oh Allah, all praise be to you, that who has taken the filth and the dirt away from me and relieved me. Imagine when a person is desperate for the toilet, <coughs> You know, many, if, if, if any house which go only one toilet and ten people are living in one house, can you imagine the status there, the long line of people waiting for the, to go to the toilet and they are desperate. What is their situation? Until they don't relieve themselves, they don't feel, they don't want to eat anything, they, they don't want to talk to somebody, they're running around. The reason is that this thing must be relieved. So we say to Allah, oh Allah, Thank you so much that you taken the dirt away from me and you relieved me. So shouldn't we thank Allah for every favor? Indeed. You're driving down the road, somebody gives you a way that you go first. How much, you know, we thank them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. For little favor of people, we thank them by raising our hands. But when Allah, our Almighty, He favored us with so many favors, so doesn't He, isn't He, isn't he, isn't he worthy of, you know, praise? Indeed He is. So two, two narrations put together, the, the dua for leaving the toilet is Ghufranak, put them together. Ghufranak, alhamdulillahi alladhi adhaba anni al-adha wa afani. I am sure most of us, we know it, but if you don't know it, please learn this dua. If you don't know it, if you don't have any book to learn from, come, come to us after salah, we'll write it for you. But do learn this dua and read it when you go to the toilet. The entering and the leaving dua. <laughs> Number three, we are told not to face the Qibla, as I, as I mentioned before, our back and our front should not be facing the Qibla. Number four, the last point is that we should sit and relieve ourselves. We should not stand. Many youngsters have this you know, habit of urinating standing. And what happens while that, we all know, the drops of urine spread and they splash and they touch our clothes and our body parts and then we don't even take care of it. This is also very danger. Why? <coughs> There's one riwayah mentioned in Bukhari and in Muslim, very authentic hadith, mentioned by Abdullah bin Abbas. The, the Prophet's cousin, Abdullah bin Abbas, he mentions that one day Prophet of Allah Maran Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam bi One day Prophet of Allah was walking and he happened to walk past by the graveyard and he walked by two graves. So he, he, he went by two graves and he said, Inna, inna huma la The 
deceased and the people who are buried in these two graves are being punished. Miraculously, Allah showed him, Allah informed him that these two people in the graves are being punished. And then he said, وَمَا يُعَذِّبَانِ فِي كَبِيرٍ It was not something big that they are punished for. Meaning in their eyes, these two habits, the bad negative habits was not something significant in their eyes. So now they are being punished. And then he explained what two bad habits they had. He said, one of them, Amma Ahaduhuma, one of, one of the two people in this grave is being punished is because La Yastatiru Min Al Baul. Whenever he used to relieve himself in the toilet or wherever he used to stand, obviously this, this is the consequence. And he never used to take care of his clothes and his body parts from the urine of the drops, the drops of the urine. The drops of urine used to touch his clothes and his body. And as the Riwayah is mentioned, La Yastanzi Min Al Baul, he never used to keep clean from the drops of the urine. So this is the reason why one of them is being punished in the grave. And second one, وَمَّ الْآخَرْ فَكَانَ يَمْشِي بِالنَّمِيمَةِ He used to slander people. He used to accuse people. Wherever he went, oh, you know what? So-and-so said this about you. To make two people fight. And many of us have this bad habit today. Without any investigation, without any authenticity, we go around, we go around tell people, oh, you know what? I heard this. Who told you? Someone so and so told me. <coughs> I had this that so and so was saying this about you, so and they were saying this about you. And for no reason they want to make them fight and they don't talk to each other for years and years. So he used to walk around with namima, slandering, accusation, complaining. So in order to fight two <coughs> Muslim brothers. So this is the reason why he is being punished in his grave. So from this we learn that there is a punishment in the grave also before the punishment in the hereafter. May Allah protect all of us. As Osman bin Affan used to cry so much for the fear of the punishment in the grave that his beard used to get wet. So people used to ask him that, Sheikh, that you know, you, we don't see you crying very often for hereafter for Jahannam, but you cry more for, the, for this graveyard. He said, yes, this is the first part of the Akhirah. If we are successful here, then inshallah Allah will elevate us there. But if we fail here, then we fail everywhere. So Prophet of Allah, he said very clearly these two people are being punished in their grave and the crime was, in their eyes, was not important. <coughs> and how many youngsters today we see walking around, you know, they, they have this bad habit. And how many of our youngsters stay clean from this filth? You must have seen, you must have seen your friends and colleagues, you know, Muslims, but they stand in urine and their clothes, their body part gets dirty. This was the number three. And then the hadith carries on that he says that Prophet of Allah took a fresh palm branch from the tree and he, he broke into two parts and he placed it on one grave each. And then he was asked, why did it, he did this for? He said, because they are punished very, you know, severely. I want Allah to, you know, decrease their punishment. So until these leaves don't dry, Allah will relieve, Allah will easy, and Allah will decrease their punishment. This was speciality of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he did not generally do this. This was his speciality, which he did it, that to ask Allah to ease their pain in, the, in, their, in their graveyard. So we can't use this hadith to apply on ourselves that we go around the graves and we start pulling, we start putting the you know fresh trees and fresh fresh branches and many people put flowers. What is the use of flowers on the graves? What benefit are we sending to the people buried in the grave by sending by putting flowers on their graves? This is un-Islamic, and many Muslims do it. We've seen them in our own eyes. Sheikh Ataullah in previous Jummah he shared a joke, which I think is good to understand. That he said two people, one was Muslim, unpractising Muslim, <coughs> and one was Chinese. Both of their fathers died, and the both of them were buried in the same graveyard. So they were friends. So they said, you know what, tomorrow we'll go to visit our graveyard and see, go, see our parents. This Muslim person, he took some flowers to put on his father's grave, and the Chinese man, he took some soup. Because according to their concept, you know, even after dying, their body, their dead bodies eat and drink soup. So they both took it. Now he placed his flowers, he placed the soup on the grave. And now they were talking, and this, this Muslim guy was laughing at him. He said, what are you doing? 
when is gonna eat? When is when is gonna get up and eat and have the soup? <coughs> he said, "You laughing at me, brother?" He said, "The day your dad gets up to smell the flowers, my dad will get up to <laughs> drink the soup." <laughs> this is un-Islamic. <coughs> the real flowers to send for our diseased is Quran. Read Quran for them. Do du'a for them. So these flowers will not help out anyway. <coughs> they are six foot under the ground. <coughs> what message are we sending? So we should always follow Islam in order to get benefit in the hereafter. The last thing was, is that when we clean ourselves, we should use water. Try to use, obviously use water, and then to be extra careful, use tissues or anything else, something similar to dry yourself, and be content that you are clean. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed one ayah of the Qur'an in which Allah has said La masjidun, a masjid, a mosque which was built on taqwa, on piety, on goodness. <coughs> Meaning before people make the masjid their intention should only be for the good, no, not for anything negative motives. And then he said Fihi rijalun, in this masjid there are people, Allah is saying all this in the Qur'an, there are people who wants to, who love to stay clean. External and internal cleanliness. Cleanliness from, you know, from all the filth around, around them and cleanliness of their hearts that they don't have any disease, hatred, hasad, jealousy for other people. So they want to stay clean. And then Allah said, and Allah loves those who stay clean. Wallahu yuhibbul with the Tahirin, Allah loves those who stay park, pure and tahar, tahir. Prophet of Allah, he went to people of Medina because this verse was revealed in Medina regarding the people of Medina, the people of Masjid Quba. He <coughs> said, Ya Mashar Ansar, O oh, oh, people of Ansar, Allah has praised you. He said, Allah inna Allah haqadathna alaykum fi tuhur. Allah has praised you. Fama tuhurukum. What is, what is your method of cleanliness? How do you clean yourself that Allah is praising you? They said, Prophet of Allah, that the salati for every salah we try to do wudu. Number one, for every salah we try to do proper wudu. tasilu min al janaba, and when we need to do ghusl, ghusl janabat, when a person sees a wet dream or a husband and wife, they meet each other and then they have to do farz ghusl. This is important, janabat ghusl. So we do that very <coughs> properly with three faraiz in ghusl. And number three, wanastanji bilma, and we clean ourselves, we do istinja, and we clean our, our private part with water. And then Prophet of Allah said, yes, this is the reason why Allah is praising you. This is the reason why Allah is praising you, keep hold, hold fast to this in practice of yours that Allah will keep on praising you. So this is very, very important that we take care, that when we relieve ourselves in the toilet or wherever we are, we should try to keep our body part and our clothes clean. We should try to do proper astinja in Islam. Because tahara, wudu, and proper cleanliness is the key to salah, the key to namaz. Before we came to pray here, we all clean ourselves, alhamdulillah. We, we, have, we have this pride. And Salah is the key to Jannat. If wudu is not correct, how can our Salah be correct? If Salah is not correct, then how do you expect to go to Jannat? So it's very important. And number three, Prophet of Allah used to forbid people using the bones or dung for, to clean themselves. In those days, people used to use mud stones. So he never used to tell them, don't use the bones. The reason was that one day, Ibn Masood, he says that one day, one group of jinns, group of jinns, group of uh, jinn, this creation made by fire, they came to Prophet of Allah, they heard the Quran and they became Muslim. And then they said, Prophet of Allah, we have a problem that your Muslims, they when they clean themselves, they use bones, they use rotha, which is dung, and humama, which is charcoal, and Allah has kept our risk, our food in them. So if they're going to use that, and you know, for our information, when a Muslim slaughters an animal, reading Bismillah, and he consumes that meat, and the bones which is left over, which, which Muslims ate, 
those bones are the food of jinns. And they only eat those bones which were slaughtered according to Islamic system with the name of Allah. So says, this is their food. So they said, if they're going to use bones to clean themselves, they're going to hurt themselves, number one. And number two, this is our food. Jinns, which we can't even see, are, is complaining to Prophet of Allah regarding this practice of Muslims. Then he said, he told the Muslims, فَنَحَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ that we should not use such things, which is the food of the jinns, in our stinger. This Islam is there to guide. There's so many other hadiths regarding this, this practice of a stinger that we must take care that when we relieve ourselves, we clean ourselves properly. May the neighbor us upon this.